package. Uh, so at these conferences, uh, usually uh, the talks are these like either uh, leaps in innovation that somebody's come up with, uh, very inspiring, like what we saw from Citus this morning, or uh, like an in-depth analysis of like a single facet of Postgres. Uh, uh, there are two talks right after, uh, and thankfully not in the same, same time slot, uh, one exploring bloat uh, and the other one exploring um, uh, HOT, which is uh, heap only tuple uh, update optimization. And, and those are all like amazing if you just want to like deep dive and like, you know, talk about spin locks and I don't know, like crazy op batch or, or sorry, latch buffer pin optimizations that somebody's thinking of somewhere. This is not that talk. Uh, this talk is, is kind of like a surface level, I want to say like analysis of Postgres. Um, it's kind of like looking at the grand design of Postgres. Um, and the way I've chosen to do it is through the journey of a single byte. So we're just going to insert one byte of data. Uh, there's a character data type in Postgres. It's called car. Um, so we're just going to insert one byte and then see where it goes and how you update it, what happens, all the things it has to think about while it moves around. Uh, and so the reason I'm giving this talk is because I had a very non-traditional introduction to databases. Um, actually, my, the person who kind of got me into the field uh, is right here, Hetty. Uh, and so I actually started with uh, a no database background, which apparently is not uncommon. Uh, and, uh, and then I just kind of like, you know, hodgepodge and potpourri and like patched my understanding of databases. And so I've, I've realized over time that I've kind of accumulated all this knowledge. Uh, but even as I was writing the stock, I found it difficult to just gel all of that together to be like, oh my god, this is why this is this way, right? Like, oh wow, transactions, pretty amazing. Uh, so I, I'm, uh, this is where I work. Uh, it's a company called Nova. Uh, we're a Chicago-based financial uh, lending company. Uh, we basically give money and take back more money, uh, and, and we do it pretty well and responsibly, and uh, it's, it's a good company. Um, uh, we, we have a lot of databases. Uh, we have 300-plus clusters, uh, more than half a thousand databases. Uh, we have at least 10 databases, which are more than a terabyte, and this is old. I think we have like 20, 30 terabyte-sized databases now. Uh, good company, great people. Um, I was working there, uh, so we're hiring. And if you're interested, so it's the name of the talk. And I was writing this talk. I also thought it's actually the Millennials' Guide to Postgres, uh, which is as a millennial, I'm, um, I'm I'm in this like unique position where I have this conviction that I can solve anything because of Google, um, and. It works a lot, actually. You just like go Googling around, like, oh, what is this? Like, what's a cluster? And like, oh, okay. Then you ask the next next question. Just keep asking questions until you have some kind of picture or mental model of what you want to solve, and then you solve it, right? And that's a way to learn, definitely. But uh, there is there's beauty in seeing it up front as like a whole holistic design, uh, and so that's why, you know, do it. There's my bite. Okay, so uh, that's that's kind of the mission today. Uh, I, I hope I can get through all of this. So, you know, I have a Postgres database and I can't find my data. And then the simple answer is, well, it's, it's in PG data. Uh, that's an environment variable that you set when you initialize your cluster. And it's very likely that you're going to find, if not your data, at least links to your data in PG data. Uh, so what's a cluster? A uh, cluster is a collection of databases. Uh, we usually run one database per cluster, but no, you can always run many. Uh, we just run one in production because it's just easier to manage that way. Uh, so how do I make a cluster? Well, there's this wonderful utility called initDB, which does most of it for you. Uh, I didn't think this through. I see. I'm going to have to type because I thought I could copy, but uh, to copy, I'd have to run out of, you know what, let's just do that because I think it'll be easier this way. <laughs> okay. So the, the, the entire format of this presentation is question answer. So if you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand and jump in, because that's the point of this presentation. Uh, and that's what it's written like as well. So um, OK, here we go. Run this command, did a bunch of stuff. And uh, now I have a directory in user local var. You can pick anywhere, by the way. Uh, and there's my directory, and it's kind of awesome that this init db thing did a whole bunch of stuff in there. I have no idea what it did, 
But apparently, it initializes the cluster. Well, that's nice. OK, let's go back. So if we had PG data set, we wouldn't have to specify this, but whatever. So that's a lot of stuff. What, what's all this stuff? Well, it turns out that a lot of it is uh, control information and defaults, and we don't care about a lot of that. The things that we care about for this specifically are three directories. One is called base. That one. Nah. And you can see it already has three things in there. Seriously, no idea what happened. Uh, second thing is called global. Bunch of other stuff. And the final one is table space. It's, uh, and we're going to go into each one. So, you know. OK, so one of them is empty, thank God. Um, so what, what is, what's all that? It's a bunch of numbers. So uh, it turns out that those numbers are the OIDs of databases. So before we even get into that, so all of this is my data? Yeah, technically, because you made the database, or the cluster in this case. Uh, the reason why there's already stuff in here is because Postgres has already initialized a few databases for you. That's why when you connect to any Postgres instance, uh, there's already three databases by default, Postgres, template 0, and template 1. right? So those are kind of like bootstrap Postgres, uh, databases you get for free with any cluster. You can delete them. right? You don't need them. Like You can make them again if you want to. Uh, but that's why you have stuff in here. right? Uh, so OK, I haven't even touched anything here. What's going on? So I'm going to start my cluster up first. right? This, uh, OK, it started. I'm going to grep, make sure that stuff is running. OK, very good. There's a whole bunch of stuff. We don't know what that is yet, but something is running. OK, I'm going to try psql. And that's the first problem a lot of people face, which is, ah, there's no such database. Uh, that's because, by default, the psql client tries to take your logged in name and tries to connect to a database with that logged in name. So the usual thing that I do is just create it. Because I don't type psql and the database name every time. I'm, it's just easy for me to do this and connect to a database. right? So I just create a database. But now if you go back and look at those directories that we were looking at before, you'll notice that I had three of something before, and now I have four of something. So back here, I had three in base, and now I have four in base. Well, that's interesting. The only change I've made between these two steps is I created a database. right? So there's logical reasoning that will lead you to believe that, ah, these are somehow related to my database. Right? And yes, that's true. The name of the subdirectory over there is the name of your is the OID, which is the object identifier of your database. And how can I check this? It's pretty simple. Hey, look at that. 16.384 matches. Uh, where's my thing? 16.384, right? That's where all my data is, all of it, right? Uh, that's not entirely true, but yeah. So that's at least where Postgres would have you believe all of your data is. In fact, if I go list all the data inside that, ho, oh, there are actually 294 things in here. I made nothing. I made one database, which I thought was empty, but there are 294 things in here. Yeah, that's system catalogs, right? All your system catalogs that are in your database are tables. And they are already in here. And that's the data in those tables being represented in 294 files. Right? So we won't get lost in this. We'll, we're not going to play around with this. We'll just make our own thing to play around with. Right? So that's what we're going to do. Let's create a database. It's my database. Right? Now I'm going to do something called creating a table space. Uh, it does not exist. Oh, of course it doesn't. I'll tell you what a table space in one second. This is a bad idea. You would never create a table space within your root directory. Um, now I don't really care, so I'll just make it there. OK. So, and, and actually, Postgres is nice enough to tell you that. Right? It's like, hey, bad idea. It's true. Uh, so I just created something called a table space. And what a table space is, is it's a way for you to group where your data lives on your disk using some sort of file handle. Right? So what I'm saying is I'm going to create this location on my disk, and I'm going to call it special, because it's special location. Right? And now what I can do is I can make tables in that location. Right? So I said, hey, create a table. By the way, you're going to live in this place called special. Right? 
The reason for doing this is because I can choose where I want that special to be. Right? It's not like you don't have any choice. Right? It's not like all your cluster has to live in one place. Right? You can actually choose. You can say that, hey, listen, I have like these very important tables, and then I have these like eh tables. Right? My eh tables can live on 5400, I don't know if 5400 RPM disks exist anymore, 10,000 RPM enterprise disks. And my very special tables will live in this very special location, which is disk mounted to a special directory, right, backed by SSD's uh, Fusion IO. Right? So yeah, you could do that. Right? So it allow Postgres is smart enough to allow you to group tables based on the kind of traffic you want to throw at the table. That's pretty good. So I already know where this table will exist. It's in that special directory. So I can go take a look at it. So I should probably start to let's have one more window. So here, user local var uh, special. Hey, here. Apparently that's where my table lives. So that entire thing is the location to my table's file. What is this? What is this 16388? Well, if 16384 was the OID of my database and my table lives in a database, probably 16388 is the OID of my table. Easy to confirm. In fact, you can do better. Oh, sorry. You can do this. Best name of the table I made, uh, I think. And that is correct. Did I not persist that table? Ah, I made it in the wrong database. OK, let's make it again. Sorry. Table's fairly important to this talk. Okay, very good, already exists. And let's create this. Okay, and then we do this. Postgres nice enough to tell you, hey man, I don't know where your PG data directory is, but wherever you inited the cluster, starting from the root of the cluster, this is where your table lives. And that is one-to-one -one with, uh, it should be one-to-one, -one, I think. Uh, oh, my thing is called 16385 because 16384 is the name of my my own database. The Postgres open database is called 16385, and 16385 has a 16391, which is the name of my table. Right? You know what? I'm gonna open that file. Why not? Well, it's empty. Well, that makes sense because there's nothing in my table. All right. So far, so good. Uh, PG data directory is where not just your table space, it's where all of these things live. So this is my PG data, right? Yeah, it's basically the base directory, yeah. And like your cluster boots from there. So if you look at how I stood up my Postgres thing, so this is PGCTL, which is like the command to like start and stop your cluster. I point it to my root directory, which is basically PG data. You wouldn't have to do any of this if you actually exported the environment variable. I am lazy. Um, OK, so great. Now I know that that is my file, which is empty. Fantastic. OK, so let's insert something into this file already. Let's do it, sure. Insert something into the file. Clearly exists. Hey, there's something in my file. OK, very nice. Let's cat it. Let's, let's just print it, because it's all bytes. There's nothing in that file. It's a lie. Right? That file just looks full of something, but if you actually go and look at what that is, that, ah, now there's something in that file. And there was a lag between when I actually made it and when it came into the file. Right? But this, this character right here, this, uh, this like escape at, is actually the ASCII for null. Right? So when I actually made the table and put something into that, there was nothing in that file. Let's do it again. I'm going to drop my table. OK, it's gone. Create it again. And you'll notice that this time, it's kind of a different ID. Last time it was 391. This time it's 394, because new table, new ID. Yeah. So make sure you open the right thing this time. OK, it's empty. Well, let's first make sure it exists. Yeah, it's a thing. It's empty, okay? And I'm gonna insert into this file. 
okay, clearly exists. And it's just a bunch of nulls. There's nothing in it. And if you wait a little bit, it'll show up. Right? And this should already be freaking you out, right? which is, what the hell? What if I had you know, killed my database between when I inserted it and when it got into my file? Right? Like, what if somebody had pulled the plug on it? You told me, you said insert 01. Right? You said it's in that table, but it wasn't in that file. Right? So where did my byte go? It's a good question. Still not in there, by the way. Right? In fact, let's do something. We are going to do the most dastardly thing. I want to kill Postgres. Just straight out kill it. Dead, gone. No Postgres. Okay. And I'm going to start it up again. Okay. And here, here, here's the funny thing. Now it's in my file. So I killed it, I brought it back up, and suddenly it's in my file. So I was sending my logs to this server.log, and I'm going to open that up and see what happened. And actually, you can see here, it says, hey, it was interrupted. Somebody rudely killed me, and it wasn't properly shut down. And now I'm going to recover some work that I'd done and redo starts, blah, 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 forget about all of that. And then it says there was an invalid record, and then it says redo done, and then last completed transaction, and now it says I'm up. Right? So what's, what's going on? Also, here's an interesting thing. This file itself is 8 kilobytes. I wrote one byte. Right? I wrote a 1, which is a character type, which has a one byte representation. Well, that's 8 kilobytes. That's because of something called the page size, and we'll get to that in, in a bit, I promise. But So what happened? Where did my byte go? And I think uh, I counted uh, from 8.30 this morning till I started the talk. Uh, people mentioned wall at least 27 times. Right? It's because of this thing called the wall. Right? So the wall is called, uh, it, it stands for the right ahead log. Right? It's a promise that it will be in your file. Right? Like, yeah, I'll, I'll get it there. Don't worry. Your data is safe. It's like, wait, wait, what? It's in two places? Yeah, totally. It's in two places. Right? There's redundancy. First, we write it to something called a wall. Then it gets written to disk. Right? But the disk, the data file itself, is not a guarantee. The wall is the guarantee. Right? So it doesn't matter if your data got written to disk or not on your data file. It only matters if it got written to the wall. Because from the wall, I just proved to you that I can yank my Postgres out and bring it back up, and I can make it back. Right? So the wall is kind of like your master record. So yeah, if you, can, if you kill your database, it still won't get lost. Uh, there are ways to lose it, and I'm sure a lot, there are stories to tell, but no, it's difficult to lose it. Um, OK, so, so what is this wall thing? Like, you know, why, do I, why do I really need this? Like, I could have done this. You, you just duplicated my work. I need to keep it in two places now. It's crazy. Really, how hard can this be? You open the file, go to the location, write the byte, okay, and then you release the file handle. It's that simple. How, why do you have to do all this wall thing? Yeah, it's fairly simple, right? If everything works perfectly, we were writing one byte. What if I was writing 100 bytes, right? And around the 27th byte, my disk crashed, right? What if I was writing 100 bytes into a file that was one gigabyte large, and in my 27th byte, my disk crashed. Now your file is in this like inconsistent, corrupted state that I can't recover from easily because we just wanted to overwrite in place. Basically, what we're saying is that the operation of writing those bytes is not atomic. Right? It's not like you can't just be like in in uh, in uh, Linux, or, or at least through the C libraries, you'd get fseeks and uh, file open and fsyncs and whatnot. And those are writing bytes, but that's also a serial operation. At any point, I can yank power. Right? So I don't want to corrupt all of my data. I just want a record that it has to be done at some point, and then do it in a fail-safe manner. Right? So 
that's why we don't just simply open the file and write to it. Right? That's why we need this wall thing. So what Postgres really does is it opens a separate file called the wall. And it writes down your operation in the wall. Right? It's like, OK, fine. This person wants to insert a thing over here. I'm going to make a note. And this file is a special file. Right? This file, write ahead log, is called write ahead because it's append only. You can't change the history. It's literally a log. It's a do the first thing, then do the next thing, then do the third thing. If you want to undo the first thing, you've got to make a fourth thing to undo the first thing. You can't just go back and erase things. Right? So it's append only. And that's, that's actually it's, that's why it's called the write ahead log. Right? So I'm going to open that separate file, and I'm going to write down what you want to do in that file. And as long as I did that successfully, I can guarantee to you that at some point, your byte will come back. That's it. That's my guarantee. Right? That's why it wasn't on the disk immediately. That's why it came back when I recovered my system, because my system went through the wall and was like, oh, guess what? This data file, not in its final state, because this wall file has this thing and this doesn't. Right? And that's what you were seeing in the recovery logs of the system, going like, hey, got to bring this file into sync with where it needs to be. So this, this set of operations over here gives us the safety that we're looking for uh, because the wall file is append only. And if I lost power writing to my wall file, that's just a corrupt log. Right? It's like, hey, this line over here doesn't make any sense. Yeah, OK, no problem. Right? I didn't actually touch my data file. Right? I, I haven't taken a gigabyte of data and put it at risk. It's just one entry. I couldn't insert. Yeah, it turns out if you pull out the power when you're inserting, you won't insert data. Yeah, OK, that's fine. That's, that's reasonable. Right? So basically, the wall is just a translation of your DML command. It's just so much more complicated than that. I'm sure like, there are books written about it. Uh, but it's kind of like that. Right? And this just happens every time. Like Every time you issue a command, that's what's happening. When your insert comes back and says 0, 01, or your update says 0, 100, or delete says whatever, it's guaranteeing it's in the wall. It's not guaranteeing that your file looks like that. OK, well, that's nice. Um, Exactly how does this make things, uh, things safer? And so this brings us to what we've been talking about uh, since uh, almost uh, Sean started talking, which is the asset compliance. Right? So it turns out that the wall is critical to the design of two of Postgres's guarantees in being an asset compliant database, which is atomicity and durability. Atomicity means that, hey, when I tell you to do something, you're going to do all of it and none of it. Right? There's no part of it. And durability is, if you tell me that you saved something to disk, outside of somebody pulling that disk out and driving a sword through it, it better be on that disk. Right? Even though it's not on the data file, it's on the wall, and therefore it's on the disk eventually. Right? It doesn't say it's going to be on the disk right now. It just says, yes, it's on the disk. It's durable. Right? So these two guarantees are coming. Uh, it's not just the wall that guarantees this, uh, as we'll see through this talk, but the wall is allowing us to be able to, uh, is allowing Postgres to be able to guarantee these two things. So we've been talking about this wall for a while. Where's the wall? Right? So if my byte wasn't in my file, it had to be somewhere else. Somebody had to know that there has to be a one somewhere. Yeah, it's in that base directory that we were talking about, right? Very nicely named PG wall. There's my PG wall, 16 megabytes. And there you can see a very big number. And I can open it for you. It'll just make no sense. I actually tried to get it to make sense, um, but I wasn't able to compile the extensions. Uh, but yeah, it's 16 megabytes of that. It's just byte array data. Right? Turns out that A, you can find binaries. I think uh, Michael. Back here has a nice binary that uh, basically just decodes the wall for you. Uh, Sean was talking about logical wall decoding uh, in Postgres itself. Uh, so you can actually open this wall and see what it looks like. Uh, but there is this nice uh, command line uh, utility that ships with Postgres called PG control data uh, that just you point at your base cluster, and then it'll give you a whole bunch of stuff, uh, which we're not going to go into right now. Uh, but yeah, so that's where your byte is. Right? Somewhere in those 16 megabytes, there's a command that says, hey, this file needs to have a 1 in it at some point. Right? And that's a strong guarantee. 
right? So that's how we begin our journey, and uh, that's how my one byte showed up there. There's actually one more way to get my byte in there, so let's try this. Say I don't want to wait for this wall thing. That's crazy, right? Like, what the hell? I want to see my byte right now. Yeah, you can see your byte. It's fine. Uh, okay, it's movement. What happened to my... When you truncate it, you're going to create a new uh, file node. So you'll see that it's become 24576 from 16694, because that's what truncate does. And we'll see in a bit why it does that. Uh, but so now I can do this. So I can insert data. Well, first, OK, uh, that's the file. Let's insert some data in there. Let's open the file. See, all nulls. Then I can do this. That's my data, right? So there's this operation called checkpoint, and we're going to go into what checkpoint is in a second. But I can force Postgres to push my data into the disk. It's a terrible idea, but you can do it if you want, right? So before we even get there, OK, so I wrote my one. It didn't get to my data file, but I still selected from my table, and I got back one. So where is that one? Did it come from my wall? Or where, where, did, where did Postgres get my one from if it's not in my data file? Because that's where it reads my table from. Postgres has a cache. right? It has a copy of all your table's data in memory. right? They're called shared buffers. Uh, actually, it's called shared memory, but specifically what we're talking about is called shared buffers. right? So shared buffers is the, the page cache. So the eight kilobytes of data that you saw on the disk is also in Postgres's memory in this thing called shared buffers. So what Postgres does when you write your one is it writes it to the wall file, and then it, it updates the shared buffers to have a one in your table. Right? So the in-memory representation of your data has the one. The on-disk representation of your data doesn't have the one yet. It might get it at some point whenever it gets flushed to disk, and your wall file has your one. Right? So there are really three copies of your one. Right? One in memory, one on your data uh, actual table, and one in the wall file. So when I'm selecting star, I'm selecting the one from memory. Right? So why are they called shared buffers? I don't see any sharing. There's just one Postgres. No, there isn't. Every time you connect to Postgres, you open a new connection. So one second. Let's do this. OK, so there's a whole bunch of processes here, right? But you see one process here called Postgres, my name, something, something, local idle. OK, watch this. Now you see two processes, because I opened a second connection. Every time you connect to Postgres, it will cause a whole process to be created just for that client. right? Isn't that crazy expensive? Yeah, it's totally expensive, right? That's why Postgres highly recommends that you put a connection puller in front, because otherwise, every time you connect to a client, you're causing a new process to be instantiated. And that's an expensive process, right? First, the post master, which is the master process, has to fork a process for you. It has to fork all the shared memory. Well, it won't fork the shared memory, but it has to, it has to allocate a whole bunch of memory for you, for you to do sorts, for you to do. Uh, some maintenance work that you might want to do, et cetera. So it's not only expensive in provisioning, which makes it expensive in terms of latency, it's also expensive in terms of memory footprint. Right? So every time you open a new connection, you get a process. So that's why you need a, load, uh, a connection folder in front. So that's why they call shared buffers, because these buffers, this in-memory cache, is actually a shared bunch of memory that's shared between all of these. Right? So that's why I can insert in this session and read in this session without reading the file on my disk, because the data in memory, the, page, the shared buffer, which is the page cache, is shared between all my connections. OK. So if these things are shared buffers, it's a buffer, which means it's a cache, which means that at some point, it'll be evicted. Right? It's a cache. There's a cache replacement policy. Somebody's going to kick out my data at some point. What happens then? Right? 
That's called a paid swap, right? A paid swap is when basically Postgres is like, oh, well, uh, I need to bring somebody else in, so somebody's got to get out. Who's getting out? All right, you won, you're out, right? At that point, what Postgres will do is it will write your data to disk, right? That's the sync, right? Postgres is like, okay, I'm going to lose the one. Got to write your disk. It'll flush it just like a cache, right? Um, and what if, what if there's no eviction, right? Like in one case, when we were observing the behavior here, I actually showed you that the file was empty with nulls, and then I opened it like four seconds later and had data in there, right? I didn't do anything. Like I didn't call, I didn't, pull, I didn't select from a table, I didn't insert into any other table. So what caused it to be kicked out of my cache? Because nobody should have evicted anything. Uh, that's because uh, Postgres will also slowly move these things to disk on its own using this thing called a background writer. Right, so there's a process where Postgres can be like, all right, you know, you all need to go to disk because otherwise moving you all to disk at the same time is too expensive. Uh, so there's a background process which also moves things to disk. Right? So there are a lot of ways your data is going to get to disk. One is through eviction. Right? That's the paid swap. One is through this thing called the background writer, which slowly moves it. And the third thing I've already showed you is through this thing called checkpoints. So what is a checkpoint? I showed you the command, I did the thing, and it magically appeared in the file, but what, what, what really happened? So a checkpoint is literally, as the name suggests, a checkpoint for Postgres to say that, hey, at this point, the data in my files, all my data files, not just my one byte, all my data files for this Postgres cluster matches or is up to date with my wall. Right? It's a checkpoint. It says, my wall has all of these operations to be performed. This is the current state of my data files. I have synced those two to be the same at a certain point in time. And that's called a checkpoint. And the reason that's called a checkpoint is because next time Postgres starts, it doesn't have to play all of your operations in the wall from beginning. It can start from the last checkpoint because that's a point of synchronization. Right? Postgres is like, what is the last checkpoint? Oh, here, at this point, I, I can skip everything from the beginning to this point in the wall because at this point in the wall, the data on disk was accurate. They synced. They matched. Right? That's why it's called a checkpoint. So when do these checkpoints happen? Uh, that's a very complicated question. Right? Uh, simple question, but uh, sorry, it has, it's a simple question, but a very complicated answer. Uh, they happen based on many factors. One is time, as we saw. Uh, we just wait for some certain amount of time, and then Postgres will automatically move these things along. Uh, one is uh, when I call it, if I want to, just explicitly. And one is based on how much churn the cluster is seeing. And I'm not going to go into depth into this, because again, this by itself is a book. Uh, but now you know how your data gets to disk, right? Okay, so that's my data, right? Here's, here's my, that's, that's my data. That's my one byte. It looks like eight kilobytes, and we'll go into why in a second. But that's my one byte. It's on disk. Very good. Um, but now, hopefully, when you look at this, have you ever done PSEF Postgres before, just to see if your Postgres was running? Okay, you see all of that? Hopefully now a lot of that starts making sense. Right? There's a check pointer process, which does what? Makes checkpoints. There is a writer process, which does what? Slowly moves your bytes from your shared buffers to your disk. There is a wall writer process, and we'll go into that later. Uh, and now you also know why those connections happen, because every time you connect to Postgres, you spin up a new backend, a uh, new server, uh, process. OK. All right, what you showed me wasn't one byte. It was just a bunch of gibberish. Yeah, that's true. It, it's just it's actually eight kilobytes, and it's just a sequence of bytes. Inside, it actually looks like this, right? It's uh, all the data in a file is divided into something called a page. A page is like the minimum block or unit that Postgres deals in, right? Postgres doesn't deal in like one bytes. It deals in eight kilobytes. You can change that. You'll have to recompile Postgres, I believe. Uh, but by default, it's 8 kilobytes. So that's why when you want to write one byte, Postgres has to allocate 8 kilobytes, because that's, small, that's as small as Postgres deals. right? Otherwise, chump change. Uh, so in that 8 kilobytes, this is what is there. right? Each 8 kilobyte is broken out into this. right? There's a header, and then there's a bunch of tuple IDs and tuples and blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to go into what each one of these is. 
uh, because I am running out of time. Uh, but that's what is in each one of your files. And if, you, if I insert enough data to exceed my 8 kilobytes, then another 8 kilobytes will be provisioned, and my file will now be 16 kilobytes. And it's now made of two of these things, right? And then three and four, and that's what ultimately a file looks like. Um, and as you can see, I said that it's a maximum of one gigabyte because that's how big files get in Postgres. If it exceeds one gigabyte, Postgres will make a new file, and it'll call it underscore zero, and underscore one, and underscore two, uh, and all those files together are your table, right? Because Postgres doesn't make things more than one gigabyte per file. And that's also a whole other talk as to why. Okay, great. I have all this. My byte is on disk. I can simply update this, right? Yeah, you can. Just update and you know, you're done. In fact, we are, uh, I think I prepared a, yeah. <laughs> so it uh, turns out that uh, there are only so many byte characters that can fit into one byte. Uh, ASCII only has like uh, 200 and something something characters, right? So, but only 126 of them make sense. Uh, so, um, and I actually made like a million updates. So I already compiled all of that into a SQL file, and that's what I'm just going to run. Uh, so here we go. All right. Just let this run for a while, right? Just updating my byte over and over and over and over and over and over, over, over again. Right, just writing it, it was one, then became two, three, four, at percentage sign, underscore, space, blah, blah, blah. Right, just a bunch of updates. Okay, that's enough. Uh, so yeah, I updated my byte. Okay, so the final value of my byte was whatever the last value in my update was. Yes. Which means that my data was overwritten in my file. No. So if you actually open the file now, Ah, it's even vacuumed. Crap. How can I show this? Okay, I'm gonna show you something. So there is this thing called CTID. Okay, so CTID is where on the file your data is, right? It's the tuple ID of your data. So if you have two things, your second data element is two, and then your third data element is three, and then four, and so on and so forth, right? That's the CTID. I'm going to do one update here. OK, it's L for whatever reason now. It's going to become 2. My CTID moved. Right? My CTID went ahead. Instead of 47, it's now 48. But I updated. I didn't insert anything new. Right? Different CTIDs mean different rows, but I only have one row. I'm just updating. Right? Why would it make a new CTID? That's, that is what the rest of the talk's about, actually. Right? And in fact, if I force this out, like just force Postgres to write all this out, look at this. My file's gotten bigger. I just updated. How can my file get bigger if I'm just updating one data element? And that is because of something called MECC, and we're going to talk about that. OK, so why isn't my data on disk being overwritten? It's because we are not the only people using this thing. Well, right now I am, right? But in any Postgres installation, there's concurrency, right? Multiple people are working with the data at the same time. So let's do a test, right? I have two sessions here. I have a begin, let's see. It's one transaction, begin, do a transaction, okay? Then we're gonna run this thing, which is, which gives me the transaction ID basically, right? It's like, okay, you have two transactions, the first transaction, its ID is 57,456. Second one is 57,457. Okay, very good. Then I'm going to run this query, which is like, uh, oh no. Oh, sorry, that's not Postgres. Uh, yeah, okay. So I ran the same query in two places here. And then I get back this thing, right? So it says, hey, your value of your byte is 2, because that's what I updated it to last. And then there are these two other fields, right? So there is, you, this is, there is so much of what you see in your table, and there's a whole bunch of hidden information. And these things, x min, x max, these are all like tuple level header hidden information, right? And uh, what is that? What is x min and what is x max? So Postgres has to account for the fact that multiple people are working with the data at the same time. And it does that by using this thing called x min and x max. 
And what that is, you probably guessed by now, given that my transaction IDs are 57,456 and 57, and xmin says 55, is the minimum ID of the transaction that's allowed to see this record. Right? Transactions with an ID of less than 57,455 won't see this. 56 and 57 can see it because, well, they're higher. Right? But xmax is the max ID of the thing that's allowed to see this record. And it's zero right now because there's no reason nobody can nobody should stop seeing this record because it's a nice record, right? Now I'm going to do this. In one session, I'm going to update uh, test byte. Oh no, byte test. Sorry. Okay. So it was two. I'm going to say it's three. I'm selected. Right? Now you see that it's three and it's moved ahead. The x min is 57,456, which is my current transactions ID, and x max is zero. Fantastic. I'm going to fire the same thing here. And that's different. Right? So one session says it's three, and the other session says it's two. Well, that's weird. Right? And this is because of concurrency. Right? Like this is like the asset compliance and everything that people are talking about is exactly because of this. Right? that my data can't change underneath me while I'm working on it. Right? Postgres needs to account for the fact that if you saw a two and somebody changed it to a three, it can't change your belief of two to three halfway through. Right? It has to support that you have to see a two while somebody else has changed it to a three at the same time. Right? And in fact, you can see that. Right? You can see that it ends. 57,456 is the last transaction that's going to Start, uh, sorry, stop seeing this, right? I'm 57,457. Why do I see it? That's because I'm running in something called a read committed mode. But more on this later. OK, so this is weird, right? Like, why, why am I seeing these, these conflicting things? And here's what gets more weirder, right? If I roll this back, it goes back. It's two. Also two, right? So it was three for some time, and then it went back to being two, and then it was three for one person and two for another person. It's just like crazy confusing. So what's going on here is something called transaction isolation, right? So remember ACID, A, C, I, D, A, atomic, D, durable. The C, sorry, Z is consistent, and we're not going to talk about that in this talk. But the I, that is, that is the million dollar question, which is isolation, right? I want to believe that I'm the only one. Right? I want to believe that it's my database. I'm doing things on my database. I'm changing data as I see it. I don't care if there's somebody else. I just want to be the only one. And Postgres is like, sure. I can't really give that to you, because if I gave that to you, that means that nobody can use a database while you're using it. But I'm going to let you pretend like you're the only one. Right? And the way it lets you pretend is by doing this tricks and magic. Right? It's like, OK, you see a 2, you see a 3, and then you roll back. OK, so you go back to seeing a 2. So it basically allows you to change your visibility over concurrent transactions. Right? It's like, hey, the other transaction made it a 3, but you don't see it because you didn't want to see it. You wanted to believe that your 2 was a 2. Right? What if it had committed? What if that transaction had finished? Do you want to see a 3? Because it'll change to a 3. Right? Like, I, ha I can't hold that person up because you're working on this data. If I did that, then only one person can work on the database at once. Right? Like, it'll start serializing everything. Right? So how do, I, how do I balance this? No other choice. Got to make copies of data. Right? I can't hold that person up while I let you do whatever you want to do with your data. And so that brings us to this thing called MVCC. Right? MVCC is multi-version concurrency control. And uh, that's actually in this slide. Right? So Postgres gives you the option of knowing what you want to know and nothing else. And that is through transaction isolation. So what it says is, what do you want to see? OK, you began a transaction. Tell me how you'd like me to behave for you. Do you want to see things that other people are going to commit? Or do you not want to see that? Right? Do you want to see as the world around you is changing? Or do you just want to be in your own bubble? But the fact that it has to support this option means that it has to make copies of data. And that's why my data file is bigger. Right? There's more data in there than I started out with, even though I was doing just updates. Right? Because Postgres maintains versions of your row. There's not just one row. 
there's not just two rows, three, four, five. There are many versions of your rows in the same file, right? And that's called dead tuples, right? Like each one, as, as your row changes, it dies, the old version, and there's a new version, and that's your live tuple, and then all the other ones are your dead tuple. So you accumulate this bloat as you go on, right? Your file's just gonna get bigger over time as you update your data. Right? And that's precisely for this reason, so that concurrently people can access and believe in different things. Without this, we would have serializability, right? which is, okay, you go, then you go, then you go. You can't go all at once. Because if you went while this guy was going, and this guy thought that his byte was two, and you changed it to three, well, this guy's world's gonna come crashing down around him. Right? So you have to let him believe that it's a two, so after he finishes, you can go. But then I sacrifice all my concurrency, which means I won't have any performance anymore. Right? And so that balance Postgres gives you through MBCC. Right? So that's why you have more than one copy of data. And here's a simple way to reason about isolation. There's actually just one question that you need to answer. Right? Do you want to see the effect of a concurrent transaction while you are doing your work? I have two transactions here. Let's try this. Begin one transaction, begin two transaction. Oh, that's apparently I'm already in a transaction. Okay. Begin second transaction. Okay. They're both two. I have to uh wanna do this. This thing called transaction isolation is my current belief, or what I'm telling Postgres, what I want to believe about the rest of the world. Right now, it's set to this thing called read committed. Forget about what it's set to, right? I'll just tell you about what happens. So it's currently set to read committed, right? So let's begin a transaction. I'm going to update something here. Update byte test set test byte to three, okay? And it's still two. To this guy, it's three. Right? Now I'm going to commit this transaction. And this is the question that we need to answer. When I commit this transaction, this guy, should he continue seeing two or should he see three? That's it. That's the question you need to answer. If you want him to continue seeing two, we are in the wrong option. If I do this right now, he will see three. Right? It was two. It changed to three because somebody else did their work. And that's because I answered this question as yes. Yes, I want to see concurrent values as they come in, right? I want to see changes, and that'll lead to that behavior. I can change that behavior, right? So now let's do this again. Begin. Three, okay. And let's roll back this transaction. Well, okay, let's begin again. And now I can do this. Set transaction isolation level two, I'm going to do this thing called serializable. If I spelled it right, serializable. Ah, there's, there's not two, I believe. This controls a different level of visibility. This is my answer to this question being no, right? Which means that when this guy commits, so let's see here. What is my belief of that? It's three. What is this guy's belief? Well, let's update this to something, let's say four, right? And so this guy's belief is that it's four. This guy believes it's three. I'm gonna commit it. This guy continues believing that it's three, even after the other transaction committed. And that's because I said, I don't want to feel the rest of the world in my transactions, right? It doesn't mean the rest of the world is not going on around you. It's going on. Things are still changing. You just get to pretend that there aren't. Right? Like you just hide yourself. You put on blinders and you're like, my transaction, I'm just going to see a snapshot of the data as my transaction saw it when it started, and I don't care if things change. And the only way Postgres can support that is through MVCC. It makes copies of your data. Right? So that's why your file's not being overwritten. Okay, so does this mean that Postgres is fully parallel in execution, so it's just making copies left, right, center? No. When, if both of us try to update the same thing, let's do this. And I'm almost out of time, so I'm not going to be able to get through the end, but let's say we both did this. Okay, I'm going to set this to five, okay? 
And then here, uh, no update statement. Update byte test, set test byte to six. It's hanging, right? It's like, can't do it. Again, just because you put on blinders doesn't mean the rest of the world's not going on around you, right? So what Postgres is saying right now is, somebody else already updated this, right? I can let your select statements believe that it didn't happen, right? I can change the visibility of what's happening, but I can't change what is happening, right? The fact that somebody's updating that to a five or a six or a seven is happening whether you want to care about it or not, right? So now when I want to change it, Postgres is like, no, now get in line, right? Because if you want to change the same thing somebody else is changing, I can't, like one of you has to win, right? Like ultimately only, it can either be six or seven, and it's got to be six first or seven first, right? It's six first, because this guy came first, right? As soon as this guy commits all rollbacks, right? This guy will go ahead, right? So it will block you. So Postgres, it, will, it allows you to select what you want, but it's not magical, right? So not everything is parallel. So it's parallel within boundaries of safety and correctness. Um, I think I'm out of time. Uh, this, this talk was more ambitious uh, than I originally planned. As I went through the stock, I realized how much has to go into explaining the internals of Postgres. What I haven't been able to get through here is this thing called um, bloat. I kind of mentioned it, uh, but good news. Uh, I think two sessions after me, uh, Peter, uh, I can never say his last name, Guggenheim, I think, uh, brilliant uh, Postgres contributor, is going to be doing a in-depth review of bloat in Postgres. And uh, there he's going to talk about, hey, so you create all these dead tuples. How do you get rid of them? How do they go away? Uh, how do you make your file smaller again? What is the effect of having all this bloat? That being said, this talk is intentionally structured uh, to be like a dialogue, like a question answer session. right? Uh, my talks usually aren't so full of uh, words, they're usually pictures, but the reason I wrote so many words in this is because I was afraid I wouldn't be able to get through all of this. So I'm gonna upload these slides to the conference uh, website whenever that comes up, uh, and hopefully you follow the questions, because these are all the questions I asked. I was like, why do I care about this bloat? Why does this happen? So hopefully those questions kind of make sense, and you can kind of walk yourself through the rest of the stock.